Hey there boys and girls, Mr. Marek here. In this video we are going to study what happens when the forces on an object are not balanced. We're going to typically refer to this unit of study as dynamics, as in the opposites of statics. So first a couple of things for us to remember. Remember that forces are pushes and pulls. We can measure those in newtons. Remember a newton is a kilogram times meter per second squared. Forces are vectors, so directions are important when we draw those things. If the forces are balanced, then the object's motion does not change. We call that the law of inertia. Remember that the weight of an object can be given by mass times the gravitational field. And remember on this planet, the gravitational field has a value of 9.8 newtons per kilogram. And then lastly, remember that we can draw free body diagrams to show the forces on an object. So previously, we had done things like this, where we had an object with a couple forces acting on it, like this one, but the net force was zero because the forces were balanced. And when the forces are balanced, we learn that the velocity is constant. So today, we have to kick it up a notch. We have to understand what happens when the net force is not zero or when it is unbalanced. So let's talk a little bit about unbalanced forces. When the forces on an object are unbalanced, meaning that the rights are bigger than the lefts, or the ups are bigger than the downs, then the velocity is not going to be constant. And remember, we call a change in velocity an acceleration. So if the velocity is not constant, that means it's going to accelerate. It's always going to accelerate in the direction of the net force. So to find the net force, we just do the vector sum of all the forces acting on the object. Whatever direction that force points in, that's the direction the object is going to accelerate. So let's look at a couple real quick examples. Suppose we have something that looks like this, where we have an unbalanced force going to the right. In this situation, the object is going to accelerate to the right. Either it's going to be moving to the right and speeding up, or it's going to be moving to the left and slowing down. Either way, the acceleration will be to the right. If we were to reverse the direction of that blue tension arrow, then that thing is going to accelerate to the left, because the net force pointing to the left. The up and down balance, the one left over is to the left. What if we had something like this? where we had a big upward normal force and a small downward gravitational force. In this situation, since the up is bigger than the down, the net force would point up and the object is going to accelerate upwards. So the first rule we have to understand here is that when the net force is not zero, then the object is going to accelerate in the direction of the net force. So be careful right off the bat. Just because something accelerates to the right does not mean that it is moving to the right. The direction of the motion and the direction of the acceleration are not always the same. In fact, they're going to be in opposite directions when something is slowing down. So a real big misconception we kind of got to be wary of as we move forward. So let's look at our three examples again. We said a second ago that something that looks like this will accelerate to the right. Something like this would accelerate to the left. And then our third example, we said it accelerates upwards. Well, if that first object is initially moving to the right, the second object is initially moving to the right, and the third object is initially moving downward, our first object is going to keep moving to the right and it's going to speed up. It's moving to the right, it accelerates to the right, it's going to speed up. So if these things are in the same direction, we have something speeding up. In the second example, if it's moving to the right but accelerates to the left, that means it's going to slow down. So if these two things are in opposite directions, that indicates that we're slowing down. What about the third example? The motion and the acceleration are in opposite direction, that means it's going to be slowing down. So, real quick rule, if the net force on an object is in the opposite direction of its initial velocity, that indicates that it's something that's slowing down. 
So the next thing we want to do is figure out how big a motion change we're going to have. So our big rule is that an unbalanced force causes a change in an object's motion. The next question is, how much does it change by? And as it turns out, we have a really important rule for that. It's usually called Newton's second law. And the rule goes something like this. The larger the force on an object is, the larger its change in motion is going to be. And the larger the object's mass is, then the smaller its change in motion is going to be. And we can actually write this rule mathematically in three different ways. If we write it in terms of acceleration, then the rule looks something like this. Acceleration is net force divided by mass. If we write it in terms of momentum, then we get a rule that looks like this. The change in momentum equals the net force times the time. And we can also write this in terms of kinetic energy, where the change in kinetic energy is equal to the force times the displacement. And so there's three different ways to express the rule that larger force equals larger change in motion, and larger mass equals smaller change in motion. Because remember, momentum and energy will depend on the mass. So we can kind of remember these equations, that acceleration is just change in velocity over time. Momentum is mass times velocity. And kinetic energy is one-half mass times velocity squared. Last thing to kind of add to this, the quantity F delta T is often referred to as the impulse. And the quantity force times displacement is often referred to as work. And if you wanted to, you could symbolize work with a capital W. So three different ways to express the big idea that larger forces cause larger changes in motion, larger masses resist changes in motion more, and so the change in motion will be less. So let's look at a quick example when we look at all three of those ways of thinking about it. Suppose we have a 25 kilogram object that has a net force of 50 newtons acting on it. And let's just suppose that the force acts on it for four seconds. The object starts from rest, and then while this is happening, it moves forward 16 meters. We want to find how much acceleration the object has, how much momentum it ends up with, and its kinetic energy. So finding the acceleration, we just substitute into the first way of writing Newton's second law, net force over mass. So 50 newtons over 25 kilograms. I'm going to real quick rewrite a newton as a kilogram times a meter per second squared. Remember, that's what a newton is. So that we can see how the units work. Kilograms cancel out, leaving us with just meters per second squared, which is what we'd expect acceleration to be in. So that's relatively straightforward plug and chug. Figure out how much momentum we've got. We can use the second way of writing Newton's second law, which is change in momentum equals force times the change in time. So substituting in our force and our time, that would be 50 Newtons times 2 seconds. Again, I'm going to write a Newton as a kilogram times a meter per second squared, so we can see how the units work. The second squared cancels out with the 4 seconds leaving us with 200 kilogram times meter per second. Coincidentally, that unit, kilogram meter per second, doesn't have a fancy name for it, so I've gone ahead and named that after myself. I refer to that unit as the mark. Kind of cool. Got my own unit named after me, mainly because nobody else claimed it. So you can say, instead of kilogram meter per second for momentum, you can say mark if you want. Okay, so the final momentum would be the initial momentum plus the change, like what we started with plus what we gained. And so since we started at rest, we started with no momentum, meaning that the final momentum would be 200 marks, something like that. Using the third way of writing Newton's second law, we can find the kinetic energy. So again, just substituting in our numbers. I'm going to again kind of break down the units a little bit. So multiplying 50 newtons by 16 meters gives me 800 newtons times meter. And a newton times a meter is called a joule. 
So if we did not get that previously, we might want to jot down that a newton times a meter is called a joule. Symbolize that with a capital J. And again, to find the final energy, we would simply add the original energy plus the change. The original energy was zero because it started at rest. And so we would get something like 800 joules for the final energy. So all three of those expressions are useful in their own particular ways. So let's do one more thing with this example. Let's use all three of those different ways of expressing Newton's second law to figure out how fast this object is going after moving forward for four seconds. So using the acceleration, we just have to remember that acceleration is change in velocity over time. Solving that for change in velocity, we get acceleration times time. Substituting in our unit, or our numbers rather, with the units. And that would give us something like 8 meters per second for the change in velocity. Again, the final velocity would be initial plus change. The initial was 0 because it started at rest. Give us a final velocity of 8 meters per second. So doing it with the other two methods, we should get the same thing. Let's see. We know that momentum is mass times velocity. Solving for the velocity will be momentum over mass. So 200 marks over 25 kilograms. Kilograms cancel out. 200 over 25 would be 8. So thus far, we've got the same thing for both the first way of writing it and the second way of writing it. Let's see if we get the same thing using the energy equation. So kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. Solving for v, we would get the square root of 2k over m. Again, doing our substitution. I'm going to write a newton as a kilogram times a meter per second squared. Remember, a joule is a newton times a meter. So that would be kilogram meter squared over second squared. The kilograms would cancel out, leaving my unit right now as meters squared over second squared. And then when you take the square root of that, you would get meters per second. And notice we take the square root of 64. That gives us 8 again. So all three methods ended us up at the same spot. Find a final velocity of 8 meters per second. So all three relationships work the same way, and they mean basically the same thing. Some are just more useful in certain situations. Momentum and energy are very useful when we start studying systems of objects, as in where we have multiple objects which are interacting with each other, because momentum and energy are often the same in those situations. Like they don't change um, as things happen. And so that's why there's three useful ways to write Newton's second law. Primarily, we're going to be focused on the first one. So let's look at a couple more examples. Suppose we have some object, the mass is 5 kilograms, that, does, that looks something like this, where it has four forces acting on it, a 75 Newton tension force to the right, and a 55 Newton friction force to the left. And we want to know what's the acceleration of this particular object. We're going to start out the same way we did before. Draw a free body diagram first. Did that. Then write an F-force equation for each direction. So vertically, that would just be the normal force minus the weight. Horizontally in the x-direction, it would be tension minus friction. The vertical forces are balanced, so I can still set that net force equal to zero, but the horizontal forces are not balanced. The horizontal forces add up to something like 20 newtons. So just substituting in my numbers, I figured out how big that net force is. And then to get the acceleration, I've just got to divide that net force by the mass of my object. So 20 newtons over 5 kilograms would give us an acceleration of 4 meters per second squared. And it's a good habit to note that from this picture we can actually tell which direction the acceleration is. So we should label that the acceleration is to the right. Notice this doesn't mean that the object's moving to the right. That just means its acceleration is to the right. Let's look at a second example. Suppose we had a free body diagram that looks something like this, where we have a 100 kilogram object that's being pulled up by a rope of some sort. And we know that it's accelerating downward at 2 meters per second squared. 
And now we kind of want to work this backwards and figure out how big the tension is. So we know what the weight of this thing is. Don't forget that that's still something we know how to do. So we know that this thing weighs a thousand newtons. We're still going to write a net force equation. So my net force would be the weight minus the tension. You may go that we normally would make tension positive, but when we're dealing with accelerating objects, often it's easier to work the problem if we make the direction that it's accelerating our positive direction instead. So in that equation, there's two unknowns. I don't know what the net force is, and I don't know what t is. So I have to figure out what the net force is first before I can solve for the tension. Fortunately, I can do that using Newton's second law. So if I take Newton's second law and I solve it for the net force, I would get something like that. And so I can find the net force just by multiplying the mass by the acceleration, which would give me something in the neighborhood of 200 newtons. Now that I know how big the net force is, I can solve my net force equation up here for the unknown tension. And so getting the tension by itself might look something like that. And then just plugging in my numbers, I would get something like 800 newtons. And so my equation up there at the top would be something like 1,000 newtons here for Fg. 800 newtons here would give me a difference of 200 newtons, which is what we calculated it to be over there. So once we write our net force equation and we write our expression of Newton's second law, we have all the information that we need to find missing forces in the problem. So do this. Try this one on your own. Got some random 4 kilogram object which is pulled to the right by a strain which exerts 80 newtons of force, causing the object to accelerate to the right at 1 meter per second squared. We want to figure out what the missing force of friction is on the object. So hit the pause button for a second. See if you can draw the free body diagram, write a net force equation, solve for the missing force of friction, and then press play, see what I did, and see if it matches what you did. So here's what I did. There's my free body diagram. There's all the stuff that I know. I know it's accelerating to the right, so tension has to be larger than the friction force, so I drew it longer in my free body diagram. So I can first figure out what the net force on the object is using Newton's second law. I have the mass. I have the acceleration. So I can say that it's got a net force of 4 newtons. And since it's accelerating to the right, that force would be to the right. Now I can write a net force equation. Net force would be tension minus friction. I can solve it for friction. Substitute in my numbers. So the difference between 80 newtons and 4 newtons would be 76 newtons. And then don't neglect the direction because we know it was being pulled to the right. We know friction has to be acting to the left. So include that as part of your answer there. So real quick summary. Always draw a free body diagram. We should be used to that by now. Always write net force equations for both directions. And then use some expression of Newton's second law. Which expression you use is going to depend on the problem you're given and the information that you have. So you'll have to kind of analyze what you've got, what you're looking for, in order to decide which expression of Newton's second law is going to be most useful. So remember those two things. And you'll never go wrong. Till next time, ta-ta.